segment is being shot today. It's August 20th. We're standing in a cornfield in northern Columbia County. This is a field cornfield. Uh, my name is Eileen Cullen and I'm the field crop extension entomologist um, at the University of Wisconsin Entomology Department and UW Extension. The insect pest that we're talking about in this segment is the western bean cutworm. Uh, this is a relatively new pest to Wisconsin. It's native to North America. Uh, it's actually something that's been around for years in states in the western corn belt like Nebraska. Uh, Colorado, for example. It's moving eastward, it's expanding its range, and it's been found in Wisconsin since about 2005 in very light numbers. As you'll see through the talk today, it's actually increasing uh, since that time. Uh, Western bean cutworm, for full details, I'd like to refer you to a new UW Extension publication. The number is A3856. It's a Western bean cutworm, a pest of field and sweet corn. It actually gets its name because out in the western corn belt it can also infest dry beans. Uh, but we're talking about it here today as a corn ear pest. So again, this is a late season corn pest, different than cutworms that we see early in the season. Uh, western bean cutworm has one generation per year. Uh, it overwinters, if you think back to the calendar year in January, western bean cutworms are overwintering as large larvae in the soil. They form an earthen cell, a little pupation or a, an overwintering chamber. When temperatures reach 50 degrees Fahrenheit, we can start to accumulate degree days. Heat units start to accumulate that that larva can then pupate in the soil chamber and then emerge as a moth. That emergence of the moth, which will then lead to moth flights in Wisconsin, that emergence of moths starts around late June. Um, the moth flights then typically in the upper Midwest tend to peak in later July, around the third week of July. So that life cycle, it's overwintering in the soil as a larva, it's pupating in the soil. In late spring and early, rather late June, kind of the, the first part of summer, uh, the moths are starting to emerge and, and uh, you'll have a moth flight in Wisconsin. They'll be attracted to tasseling corn, or rather actually pre-tasseling, before that tassel has emerged, just about it before it's emerged from the corn whorl, um, female moths will be attracted to lay eggs on these um, on, on corn plants. So just a couple things to keep in mind again, the, the, the eggs will hatch, they'll be small larvae, they'll be on the outside of the plant, and as we'll talk about later for management, it's going to be very crucial to control the western bean cutworm before they enter the corn ear. That's where they're going to spend the lo longer part of their larval life stage. Uh, the larger life cycle, are, there are about six and occasionally seven larval instars for western bean cutworm. Once that larva is in the ear, of course, it's too late to control the pest. So we'll be focusing our management on when the uh, pest is on the outside of the plant. Once it's in the ear, um, when it's done feeding at that sixth or seventh larval instar, it'll drop to the ground to pupate and it'll start that life cycle over again. And just a couple final points about the life cycle of western bean cutworm. You want to keep in mind that it is different but similar to some of the other corn ear pests that we have in Wisconsin. It's similar because in a corn ear, uh, as you'll see in this field here today, we do have in these corn ears western bean cutworm, corn earworm, and some occasional second generation European corn borer. Um, what's different about western bean cutworm and what's similar, you look at something like corn earworm. It does not overwinter in Wisconsin, but it flies up, it has migration flights from the southeast part of the United States, and then several generations within season here. That's the corn earworm. By contrast, western bean cutworm does overwinter here in Wisconsin, and it has one generation per year. Finally, if you contrast it with European corn borer, there are two generations per year. And at this time of the year in August, if we're looking at corn ears or corn stalks, for European corn borer, we're concerned with second generation European corn borer, which does overwinter in Wisconsin as well. Again, with western bean cutworm, this is the only time of year, it's just that one time of year, the one generation of western bean cutworm that we'll be focusing on. Uh, the first method with western bean cutworm degree day units, starting from January 1st and accumulating 1,320 degree days, so about 1,300 degree days. Um, this is all detailed in the UW Extension publication A3856. Uh, at 1,320 degree days, western bean cutworm degree days, that signifies that 25% of the moths have emerged from those uh, earthen soil overwintering chambers. That tells us that 25% of the moths are flying, that moth flight has begun, and that's a good time to get out and start to look at corn leaves for egg masses and small larvae. 
The other way to know that it's time to start scouting for western bean cutworm is to access the western bean cutworm uh, pheromone trap network. This is available through the web online. It's also detailed, the website and the information in publication A36, I'm sorry, A3856. Um, this is a website that is actually maintained by the Iowa State University, but it includes western bean cutworm pheromone trap catches from throughout the region about 12 different states and all throughout Wisconsin. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge both the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, the pest survey uh, led by Krista Hamilton for her work with the Western Bean Cutworm Network throughout Wisconsin, and many UW Extension County faculty throughout the state, as well as private consultants and some farmers that are helping to, to add Wisconsin pheromone trap catch to the network. When pheromone, uh, you can go onto that website and when a pheromone trap catch has begun in your county or near your area, um, even if it's not a trap that you are maintaining yourself, if it's near your area, that's another way to alert you that as soon as moths are start to be, to be captured in those pheromone traps, it's time to scout the plant. To do that, uh, this is generally again occurring in about the last part of July, so you can think about the last end of the third week of July, typically in that time, the latter week of July, that the, the moths are flying. In some years it may be a little bit earlier, but it's, it's around that time. Um, you're going to be looking again, this would be back in July, um, before this corn plant has tasseled in most cases. Um, and the western bean cutworm females are looking to lay the eggs on the upper part of the plant. So you're simply going to be looking at um, the leaves on the plant, not all the leaves on the plant, uh, but I recommend looking at the upper leaves on the plant. Now, of course, corn can be quite tall. Um, you do have to actually sometimes bring the corn plant, uh, bend it towards you. Um, look at the corn leaf, and it's a quick scan of the top of the leaf and the underside. And I would do that with three to five leaves. I'd, to be on the safe side, look at five leaves. You've looked at the flag leaf, the next two leaves down, the upper and lower surfaces. And again, doing that with leaves above the ear and to be safe right around the ear zone. What you're looking for again are those western bean cutworm egg masses. This is past the stage we just talked about with um, scouting corn. This is the eggs have hatched out. We now have mid to larger larvae, about fourth and uh, getting into fifth instar that have already entered the corn ear. If you haven't scattered a field before this point, it may be a little bit deceiving. You can see the corn here, ear here, the silks are starting to brown. Uh, the ear actually looks perfectly fine. The silks are drying out. And, uh, but when you pull back this corn ear, you can actually see without any difficulty that the uh, western bean cutworm larvae is indeed entered this corn ear. One of the first things that we see as it emerges, you're seeing the head of the western bean cutworm larva. We see the brown kind of tan colored head as it moves around and it's got two very distinctive black or three black dark bands right behind its head capsule and that's a very distinctive feature of the western bean cutworm larva. Um, otherwise it's basically a tan to sort of pink colored larva. You can see it has a light colored back and um, is otherwise you know um, not very descript but it's got those three dark bands behind its head capsule. It came out of this corn ear tip there was a bit of feeding damage, um, some frass or uh, excrement, and one of the first things that I'm seeing right away here is we've got more than one larva per ear. You can see, of course, I took that one larva out, and right away we're seeing a second larva. And again, you can see that head capsule, the black bands behind the head capsule, and that's our, at our count here, two larva per ear. That's different than your, uh, I'm sorry, that's different than the corn earworm. You typically wouldn't see two corn, uh, two larva in an ear. Uh, because the corn earworms are cannibalistic, the young larvae will tend to eat each other, kind of fight it out, and have one larva per ear. So as you can see in heavier infestations like we're seeing here, you can have multiple western bean cutworm larvae per ear. They will enter through those silks, as you saw in this demonstration. If corn ears are crowded at the silks, they'll also be happy to go down into the corn side of the corn, and they actually can bore into the plant through the husk, or into the corn ear through the husk. Um, by comparison, we've got a corn ear uh, very close by in the same field, as you can see, that does have a corn earworm. Um, we're looking at that right here, and there are several things that you can tell that are different about this corn earworm. 
from the western bean cutworm. You can see its color. I would like to note that the corn earworm can actually vary in color. What you're seeing here is a greenish colored corn earworm. They can also be pink, light brown, sometimes a dark green or a darkish black. Um, but what you will see is that if you look at the, um, the head capsule, and I can take this out of the ear, um, it, it has a, some black uh, markings behind the head capsule, but it's, it's not that those three dark bands. And you can see that it's got a, another very big difference with corn earworm. We've got a lot of these little dots, we call them tubercles, or, uh, all along the body. And if you look close at a corn earworm, you can't see it as much in the video here, but if you take a hand lens, there's going to be little bristles, little hairs coming out of those tubercles all along the, the corn earworm body. By comparison, the western bean cutworm has a smooth body. It does not have all of these little dots along the body. So again, that's another uh, corn ear pest. Corn earworms do prefer to go through the silks, and we're finding at that tip of the ear, corn earworm will do some side feeding on the ear. Unlike the western bean cutworm, the corn earworm is not going to go through the husk of the, of the ear. There are BT corn products that do include western bean cutworm on the label. Um, I would like to refer you to UW Extension Publication A3857, which does have a BT corn trait chart on the back of the publication. This is a very useful chart to keep in mind that not all BT corn has western bean cutworm uh, on its label for control. So if you are um, looking at using a transgenic or BT corn for western bean cutworm management, to really be sure that the trait that you're purchasing has that western bean cutworm on the label. So western bean cutworm is, as I mentioned in the beginning, a new pest in Wisconsin. It's emerging, um, but it's definitely here to stay. This is something that we've seen increasing in its incidence. You can see the field we're in today here in northern Columbia County. It's actually about, uh, the infestation level in this field is about 20%. So you can see it's beyond threshold. Um, this is something to keep aware of and really to work into your scouting and management plans from this point going forward in Wisconsin, because it overwinters in Wisconsin, it will continue to, um, to establish in the state. Uh, Wisconsin is not as infested as the Western Corn Belt or even as infested or, or high populations as in Iowa, but we have seen an increase between 2005 and 2008. So it's really something to be aware of. And also just keep in mind that um, you should always scout your refuges, your non-BT corn refuges in a BT corn field, even if you do have Western bean cutworm on the label. Um, because western bean cutworm could be a factor in the refuge as well.